Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to today's webinar. I'm John Belitis. I chair the Labor and Employment Department at Jennings Strauss, and I have with me today my partners, Julia Akin and Chris Mason, uh, who are uh, practitioners in the department with me. And it's, uh, it's too bad that we can't all be together in person in our normal, normal uh, seminar format down at the office, but you know, this is a, under the circumstances, this is a great alternative. We always wanna stay in touch with you and we wanna make sure that you are up to date and receive important information from us. And that's what we're going to do uh, today. We're gonna to be talking today about uh, Prop 207, Arizona's new medical, um, uh, recreational marijuana law and vaccination mandates. In other words, can you as an employer require your workforce to be vaccinated? Uh, the program is gonna run about an hour. Julia and Chris uh, each have about 20 minutes worth of material that they've prepared to discuss, which then will leave roughly 20 minutes for question and answers for us, either during the course of the presentation or at the end. And uh, I want to tell you that if you want to ask questions during the presentation, that's uh, great. Just use the chat feature in Zoom to do that. I'm going to try to uh, manage the questions and get them to uh, Chris and Julia so that they can answer them. But if we, if we get to the end, because we're trying to make this efficient in just an hour so that you can get back to your days, uh, if we get to the end and we haven't been able to uh, address your question for you, Feel free to call or email any of us. We're always willing to chat with you about this stuff. So don't worry about that. We will, we will get your questions answered one way uh, or another. Also, if, if you are an attorney and you would like CLE credit for this discussion today, also use the chat feature for that. Just make sure that you, you give us a pretty deliberate request, include your name, tell us that you would like a CLE certificate and provide a, an accurate email address and our marketing department will get a CLE certificate to you. So uh, without any further delay, I thought we would get straight to the material. Um, Chris is gonna start out uh, with Prop 207. I will just say sort of uh, by way of background, uh, Prop 207 is actually the fifth time a marijuana related referendum has appeared on a ballot in Arizona. Not a lot of people know that we actually have, have uh, or had a medical marijuana law on the books in Arizona in uh, 1996 that was passed by referendum. And it never went anywhere because uh, the mechanism for dispensing marijuana involved physicians writing prescriptions for it. <laughs> and doctors are smart people. They know that if they would write a prescription for a federally scheduled drug, they probably would either get arrested and or lose their medical license. So that, that law went nowhere. No one ever got any marijuana or anything. So then uh, we tried two more times uh, with medical marijuana in 2002, that failed. And then with Prop 203 in 2010, then it passed. And then with recreational, we tried it in 2016 with Prop 205, it failed. And then again, this fall in 2020 with Prop 207, it passed. Okay. Now, uh, you won't, no one will be able to buy marijuana uh, on a retail basis probably until uh, March or April of next year, just because of the logistics and the licensing issues that need to be sorted out. But what you all should know for today's purposes is that this law became effective when we here in Arizona certified the results of our election this fall. So either November 29 or 30, depending on who you talk to. So the point being, as of today, as we are talking today, adults 21 years of older can use it, possess it, transport it, grow it. It's all already happening. Okay. And so what that means for you as employers is that you inevitably are going to experience more people coming into the workplace who have either used it the night before, the weekend before, or whatnot. And, and that in and of itself is an important thing to talk about, right? Um, and Chris will, will discuss that with you. But even more importantly than that, uh, one thing that Chris will get into, uh, which I would encourage you to pay attention to, is um, the constitutional challenges that we are now seeing to the safety sensitive job rule that many of you have been relying on to manage medical marijuana cardholders. Uh, Chris will tell you that we think that this may go away sometime in the near future, which is going to be a big game changer 
probably more significant than Prop 207. But I don't want to take away Chris's uh, fire. So I'm just going to turn it over to him and, and, and uh, Chris, tell everybody online what they need to know in this area. You got it. Thank you very much, John. And, and everybody, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining us today, for putting some time aside to talk about these very important topics. I'll try not to repeat what uh, John just said, uh, and I apologize in advance if, if I cover some of the same material again. Uh, so starting right off, uh, I'm going to break this down into really three areas as, as we talk through it, and I encourage questions as we go through. I'd much rather answer the questions that you have than just be a talking head up here, but um, I'll talk a little bit about the, the Smart and Safe Arizona Act, which is Proposition 207. I'll transition a little bit into talking about medical marijuana, and then lastly, I'll talk about what, uh, what I expect looking at some of the tea leaves uh, going forward as, as we deal with these issues. So first off, um, just to, to lay a little foundation for Prop 207, what does it do? Well, it, it decriminalizes essentially uh, marijuana possession and use under state law. Uh, obviously there's an issue with federal law for those who are 21 or older. Uh, individuals can possess up to one ounce of marijuana. They can cultivate up to six plants as long as they do it out of public view. They have to keep it locked and secured and away from view. Uh, but, but this is what individuals are going to be allowed to do. Uh, the buying and selling is, is still restricted until DHS can put regulations in place and can authorize appropriate clinics uh, to sell recreational marijuana. Um, obviously medical marijuana is still out there. That's still going for the time being and, and we'll touch a little bit more on that. Delivery uh, may start sometime between 2022 and 2025 uh, once there are appropriate regulations in place and, and that's gonna be up to DHS. I think uh, Grubhub uh, may be the, uh, the appropriate carrier for something like that. Um, and uh, a few other really important permutations of the law, 16% additional tax on recreational marijuana, in addition to other taxes that are going to be charged. So uh, they'll definitely hit this industry with some tax and provide that for the public's benefit. I think um, the, some of the important things to note is, is uh, public consumption still is prohibited. It doesn't authorize public consumption. And really for our purposes, the real big key here is that there are no explicit employment protections within this law. It does not say, hey, if somebody's using recreational as opposed to medical marijuana, you as an employer um, can't regulate that, you can't restrict that, that nothing like that appears in this law. Um, so we get into this area when we talk about this particular proposition of recognizing that on one level, it doesn't do much, uh, if anything, with respect to employment, but on the other, it's going to have some tremendous impacts on a, probably more of a practical level. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. Um, interestingly, even though the law doesn't regulate employment related issues, um, use uh, of individuals and then coming into the workplace, um, the reality is you still as an employer have to be on the lookout for potential disparate impact type claims. Uh, does enforcement of your drug and alcohol policies, knowing that so many voters in Arizona had improved uh, this law, um, will it, it have a disparate impact on certain racial groups or, or genders or things like that? You need to be cognizant of that as you move forward. If you notice some sort of disparate impact, you, you, it's definitely something you wanna flag for your attorney. Um, as John had indicated, the interesting thing here, kind of the backdrop, is that this type of issue has come up multiple times under Arizona law. A medical law was passed in the 90s, and, and as John said, it didn't go anywhere uh, because physicians are not going to write prescriptions for medical marijuana. The 2010 Arizona Medical Marijuana Act um, kind of found a way around that. It allowed physicians to not write prescriptions. What instead they were doing was recognizing that people met the criteria of the statute. Um, those individuals would then take that determination from a physician and get licensed through the state and the state was authorizing it rather than the physician. So that, that's sort of the end run around that issue. Uh, but the reality is even that law in 2010 passed by a razor thin majority it was very, very close. And it was actually surprising for me when this law was passed to some extent because um, you know, it had been rejected in 2016, a very similar recreational marijuana law. And then when this was approved, it was a, a overwhelming majority, uh, 60 to 40 percent roughly um, approved it. And so that may tell you a little bit about your workers' attitudes, uh, attitudes in the workplace, um, people who may choose to use recreational marijuana. And, and I do recognize, and, and we'll talk a little bit about this as we go through some of the, the information and material, 
that it's still a federal crime. Uh, it's still a Schedule One drug on the Controlled Substances Act list. Um, that may change at some point. There's actually some legislation that's been introduced into the, the federal house uh, to repeal that or, or designate it in a non-controlled uh, substances uh, a drug. And we'll see where that goes. That, that may ultimately change. But as everybody probably already knows, the federal government has essentially taken the position that as long as individuals within the state, as long as providers and growers and sellers um, comply with their state laws on these issues, they're not going to intrude. And that, that really seems to have been the case uh, for quite a number of years, um, at least uh, you know, short of some of the, the early challenge cases that they had brought in California to challenge California's medical marijuana law a long time ago. But what does all this mean, this recreational law mean for employers? As I said, on, on one level, not a lot, but on another, on a practical level, um, it could mean modifying your policies recognizing that you're going to have a lot of employees in their free time on the side are using recreational marijuana. And if you have, you know, just, just to use some raw numbers, if you had 60% of your workforce choosing to use recreational marijuana, how is that going to affect your workplace? How is that going to affect your policies? Those are things you definitely want to think through. I do want to take a little bit of a foray to understand better the effect of the, the recreational law of Prop 207. I want to talk a little bit about the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act and a couple of recent developments and cases that came out in the last couple of years. Um, as, as many know, when the AMMA was passed in 2010, there's quite a reaction from employers. I think uh, what was kind of buried a little bit in the initiative, what, what folks didn't fully realize when they were voting for it, perhaps, or, or didn't see it or didn't anticipate it, was that there was an explicit employment protection buried within that enactment. That was unusual. Uh, most states that had passed medical marijuana initiatives prior to the Arizona initiative did not have explicit employment protections, but ours did, and it was very, very clear. And so we saw a very quick reaction from our legislator. Uh, legislature uh, in response to that, um, driven by the Arizona Chamber of Commerce, they, they brought an attorney, a, a very good employment attorney um, who's been practicing law for, for decades, drafted up uh, some changes to the Drug Testing of Employees Act, uh, which effectively put in a number of protections. And I won't talk about all of it. I won't uh, get into to the weeds of it, so to speak, uh, <laughs> other than to say um, that, that it, two of the, the principal things it did is, number one, it really recognized that um, uh, employers needed to rely on a good faith basis if they thought somebody was impaired in the workplace from marijuana. Uh, that they still had the entitlement if, if those using medical marijuana came to work impaired, employers can terminate them, take disciplinary action against them, you name it. And so what he had written into the law to some extent was this, this recognition that um, you need a good faith basis. And, and it, different factors that an employer could take into consideration. Now, those factors were very broad. Anything under the sun was potentially a factor for a good faith belief. Uh, if somebody came to work, you know, and, and they were stumbling, had bloodshot eyes, if, if they started acting like Shaggy from, from Scooby-Doo in the workplace, you know, anything under the sun was uh, potentially a factor, including the presence of metabolites. And we'll see in a minute why that was a big issue in the Whitmore case uh, that came out in early 2019. Um, in addition, second to that, it also recognized that employers could prohibit individuals from working in safety sensitive positions. It really created and enhanced this safety sensitive function. And of course, written within those amendments to the law, uh, to the, the Drug Testing of Employees Act law, um, everything was defined as a safety sensitive position. I think just about anything under the sun. Now, I don't, uh, I don't fault the, the, the crafter of the legislation um, obviously, what he was trying to do was, was further the purposes of the, the, the chamber and, and uh, uh, employers in Arizona who are all understandably alarmed and concerned. Um, his obviously his what he did and what he thought behind the scenes um, is, is largely irrelevant to how a statute's interpreted because we rely on the legislature's intent and, and we look to, to principles of statutory construction which that's a key aspect of the Whitmore decision, which came out, like I said, in early 2019. Um, there are still obviously special indus industries, uh, federal contractor issues, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but the big point again is, 
in this backdrop of individuals using recreational marijuana, there are still employees who have medical marijuana cards. And somehow either your policies need, need to account for that or you need to draw a line um, in the sand between recreational and, and medical marijuana use. And it's time to revisit your policies. So let me talk about the, this recent case before I, I pass to Whitmore. Um, there was a case decision in Lee versus Albertsons. Um, and interestingly, uh, the plaintiff's attorney in both the Whitmore decision and the Albertsons decision uh, was a, a gentleman named Josh Carden, uh, who uh, just seems to be spearheading some of these efforts. I know for, for many years, he and, and a number of the, the plaintiff's bar have been very critical of the legislature's uh, reaction uh, to the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act and the law that they passed. And, and its potential infringement on the rights established by the, the Voter Protection Act, which is part of the Constitution in Arizona. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But in this recent case, uh, one of our federal court judges, uh, Judge Lanza, uh, issued a tentative ruling. And this came out in October of this year. And he basically said, look, when you have a situation where, and it's very clear here, uh, this reaction from this legislature, this, this, this change to the Drug Testing of Employees Act, uh, when you have that change and it's clearly designed to minimize or undermine a public initiative that's been approved uh, by popular vote, um, it's unconstitutional. Uh, the Voter Protection Act very explicitly says that the legislature can only enhance a public initiative and can only do, do so by three-fourths vote of both houses, but it can only enhance uh, the law. It can only further the law's purposes it cannot undermine or contradict uh, what, what the public voters put into place. And so he essentially, through this tentative ruling, concluded that the safety sensitive exception that's built into the Drug Testing of Employees Act, which affects the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act, um, that it was null, that, that it was simply unconstitutional, that at the end of the day, excuse me, it couldn't be done. And um, the interesting thing is the employee in that situation was working in a safety sensitive position. And there were disputes in the Albertsons case about whether um, he was improperly impaired or whatnot, but, but uh, Albertsons had tried to argue irrespective of all, of all that, he's in a safety sensitive position. He cannot be a medical marijuana card holder. He can't use medical marijuana. Hey, Chris. And, uh, the judge so, just- so, yes. so in other words, essentially, if we're understanding correctly, the, 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 the problem here is that when the legislature amended the drug testing statute, it was effectively an end run around the voter protection restrictions that would prohibit the legislature or greatly limit it from tinkering with a voter approved referendum. That's basically what the, the issue is, right? That's and, absolutely correct. Right, and that's why, we're, that's why we're seeing these constitutional challenges. That's correct. Yeah, right. and you're spot on. And and the interesting thing, this was a federal court, right? Interpreting a state law, it's not the highest uh, the court on state court interpretations, but it does provide some very persuasive information of how this would be interpreted. It's a very thorough opinion, very detailed, um, really very, he took a scalpel to the issues and, and he provided a very, very cogent analysis um, as, as did uh, Judge Teelberg in the Whitmore case. And that was a case that, that was decided in 2019. Whitmore, interestingly, Judge Teelberg and Whitmore did not address the constitutional issue. As a matter of fact, he said, I'm gonna try to reconcile these laws, which is another principle of statutory interpretation that the judges try to make the laws fit together, even if on the surface, they may seem to, to not do so. And in that case, he addressed the question of impairment. That's really his focus in the uh, early 2019 case. And although the amendment to the Drug Testing of Employees Act said the presence of metabolites as evidence of impairment, um, he said, no, no, I can't interpret it that way because uh, the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act explicitly says you can't just rely on the presence of metabolites uh, because the presence of metabolites doesn't necessarily mean somebody's actually impaired. As a matter of fact, um, metabolites may sit in somebody's system for weeks or months after they've used depending on all kinds of factors, a whole variety of them. And, and we can't simply rely on the fact that, hey, this is evidence that somebody has used before to know that they're impaired now. And in both decisions, both judges really very thoroughly analyze the issues, whether you agree with their conclusions or not. At the end of the day, they're very cogent analyses. Um, and they do have foundation, particularly this latest case. There was the, the Maestas case that came out in mid-2018, which was decided by the Arizona Supreme Court. And that was in the context of a student at ASU 
um, who had medical marijuana on campus. And, and in reaction to a law that was passed in 2012, actually an amendment that the legislature had put in place in 2012 saying, um, of, of the places that the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act says you cannot have uh, marijuana, you also can't have them on college campuses. It, it sort of enhanced the, the restrictive places. And Judge Lanza said, no, no, no. Um, well, actually in that case, um, that particular one, the, the Arizona Supreme Court said, no, 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 you cannot undermine what the voters did though. Arizona voters specifically said the places, identified the places where you cannot have medical marijuana. College campuses was not included in that list. You can't add on college campuses to that list. Doing, doing so contradicts the, the Voter Protection Act. So since mid 2018, we had a very clear signal from our, our highest state court of the state that, hey, what the legislature was doing uh, following the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act is questionable. Um, now, how would the Arizona Supreme Court decide these federal cases if confronted with them? We don't know. I mean, we, we have a little bit of a different composition than we had on the Supreme Court back in mid-2018. But I do think the writing's on the wall of, of how our state court would deal with it. Um, interesting note, too, is that uh, the decision by Lanza was a tentative ruling. He, um, in, very notably, he, he put out what he was planning on doing, very thorough analysis, sent it to both parties. Um, he, he questioned the parties, you know, address at oral argument anywhere where you think I've got the law wrong anywhere you think I, I, got, I have my analysis wrong. And right before oral argument, the party settled the case. So that, that may you know, speak volumes for even the party's interpretation of uh, that judge's uh, written uh, tentative opinion. So it's something, uh, something to take note of. Um, we still have this issue um, going forward. I, uh, actually, the attorney who handled both of those cases on behalf of the plaintiffs, uh, Josh Carden, I, I uh, talked to him this morning because I was curious where he thought a lot of this was going. And, and he flagged really two things that, that he thought were sort of the future of, of a lot of these issues in the workplace is number one, how are we gonna judge impairment? Um, you know, if we know that the metabolites pass through the system, that they're very inconsistent, they don't really tell you whether somebody was impaired or not, um, how are we going to measure and test uh, the THC levels, the active ingredient in marijuana? And, and the science is still all over the map on this. Uh, there are some states that have tried to address this. There, there are some pundits who, who have their opinions, but the reality is when you delve deep into the issue, um, there's just no consistency on it. And, and that's going to take some time, I think, to sort through. And, and then secondly, and this is something that, that uh, we've, we've seen for years and we've sort of questioned, it's this question of federal contractors. If you look at the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act, it explicitly says that, that if, if a Arizona employer has a federal contract and, and because of that may lose that contract if they allow employees to, to have medical marijuana cards or to use medical marijuana on the side, um, you know, they, they don't have to comply with the Arizona Medical Marijuana Act. And, and I've talked to a lot of employers. They immediately say, I'm a federal contractor. Um, I have to maintain a drug-free workplace in accordance with the Drug-Free Workplace Act. And, and Josh has been saying this for years. I, I've recognized it. It's not that easy. Um, pull the, the, the Federal Drug-Free Workplace Act and see what it really says. Um, it's not written as broadly as that. Um, it, it's much more narrow. And, and for those federal contractors out there, I'd strongly encourage you to talk to your lawyer about this. You know, we talk about the parameters, um, talk about these issues, um, because you're, you're taking some risks. Uh, the, the challenge is coming someday. I don't know when, I, I don't know who's gonna bring it. It might be Josh Carden, uh, wouldn't surprise me. He's already brought a couple challenges, uh, but, but if that's your position, just, just keep in mind that, that uh, there are arguments why that, uh, that law is not broad enough to protect you in, in your particular situation. Um, I won't necessarily agree with him on a public forum like this, uh, but, but I will tell you that's something you need to take a look at. Uh, so with that, um, John, were there any specific questions? I wanted to make sure to reserve just a little bit of time to answer any questions folks might have. Well, yeah, well, one thing I'll just respond to, if any of you would like a copy of Judge Lanza's tentative ruling in the Albertsons case that Chris is discussing. I believe it came out on October 6th. Uh, just go ahead and email us and let us know. We'll send it to you. The reason I'm offering it is because it may be somewhat challenging for some of you folks to get it because uh, it, the, you may have to have an account in order to pull a copy of that ruling off of the, the federal docket. And so if you'd like to see it and read it, I think it's about 10 or 15 pages long. 
uh, we're happy to send it to you. And uh, I think the, 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 the major uh, point here that you should take away from, from a lot of what Chris is discussing is that you, you, you as employers need to keep an eye on the media and, and frankly on us, because if there's a development, trust me, we will let you know. If, if someone is successful in challenging the safety sensitive rule that the legislature incorporated into our drug testing statute as unconstitutional, you're going to have to really sit back. You're going to have to look at all, look at your policies in this area in your handbook or your manual. You're going to have to rethink how you're going to deal with medical marijuana cardholders in the workplace, because if that should happen, you're no longer going to be able to say, oh, if you have a medical marijuana card and you have to drive a vehicle or operate a piece of equipment as part of your job, uh, I don't have to hire you or I can let you go. That flexibility will no longer exist. And it creates kind of a, a scary proposition for employers, particularly ones that have high risk workplaces and construction and, and so on, um, because it really changes your ability. It, limit, it, it would limit your ability to regulate those workers. So um, people are asking for a copy of that order. So I thought I would uh, address that and let you know if you want it, uh, please go ahead and just let us know. Uh, with that, uh, we're at 10, uh, 1130. So we're gonna move on to vaccination mandates this, thank you so much, Chris, that was fantastic. Really appreciate your insight into all those issues. Like I said at the beginning, if you have follow-up questions for Chris, you can either chat them during the course of the rest of the presentation or uh, go ahead and email Chris or give him a call uh, afterward. Um, so Julia is gonna talk about vaccination mandates. This is the, the concept. It's so timely because vaccinations, as you know, have now started all across the country. Um, just yesterday, Julia will talk to you a little bit about, literally just yesterday, the EEOC published brand new guidance on the issue of vaccination mandates. Uh, it was, the guidance was dated December 16. Again, if you would like access to that, let us know. We'll send you a link to the guidance. It's available online. Very interesting. Uh, but if you've been following the polling in this area, uh, if you think back to say September-ish, uh, when polls were taken around the September timeframe, only 60% of Americans said they would be willing to be vaccinated. Um, fast forward to today, the most recent polling puts that number slightly above 70%. So now people are starting to come around and, and understand the importance of this, okay? The problem though that still exists is that if you look to the CDC, the CDC will tell us that unless we reach a minimum of 75% vaccination rate, we are not fully exploiting this protection. We're gonna to have to socially distance longer. We're gonna to have to wear masks longer. 75% seems to be the magic number. And if we don't have, and, and ethnic minorities in the United States, their willingness to get vaccinated is even much, much lower. If we can't get that, that willingness number up to 75 or higher, we, this is, we will prolong the situation. We will not be exploiting the, the solution to the problem. And so that raises the question really, what sort of, if you wanna say it, responsibility do employers or businesses have to require this? Because that would presumably push that number higher if people aren't willing to do it on their own. If you say to somebody who needs to travel, you cannot travel on our airline unless you can show proof of a vaccination. Qantas is already doing that. Or if an employer says you cannot work here or you will not get a job offer unless you are willing to get vaccinated. Well, if employers and businesses started to do these things, we probably would get closer or, or surpass the, the number we need to get to in order to fully exploit the, the solution to the problem. So that begs the question for Julia. So. Um, can employers require their workers to be vaccinated as a condition of employment? And if the answer to that question is as a general rule, yes, are there any notable exceptions? Julia? Thanks, John. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this particular issue, uh, when I started seeing blogs and things about it, it's sort of an employment lawyer's dream 
if this is your thing, <laughs> because it really brings into play just about every statute um, that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but the answer to John's question is usually yes. You probably can require vaccination, but there are some very notable exceptions. Um, and I, I find it ironic. I know a lot of you, we've heard from a lot of you over the last few months as people started coming back to the workplace and then going back home again and back and forth, uh, where many of you have struggled with maybe individuals who weren't comfortable coming into the workplace and you were trying to get them to the workplace. Well, now you're dealing with the opposite where you might have some folks who wanna to come to the workplace and you're having to say, no, 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 not unless you get a vaccine. So we're sort of seeing the inverse. And generally speaking, you under OSHA have an obligation to provide a reasonably safe workplace to your employees. Uh, so that includes reasonably safe from something like a pandemic, something like COVID-19. However, that alone, you're gonna to have to balance against the individual rights that, that your employees have under the other federal statutes. So the two main statutes we're gonna look at are going to be the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, and then also Title VII, because those are gonna be two of the primary reasons you're gonna hear as to why someone may not want to become a vaccine or not be able to get vaccinated. Uh, either religious reasons that would fall under Title VII or because they have a disability that prevents them from being able to get the vaccine. That's gonna bring the ADA into play. I'm gonna start with the ADA because the standard that an employer has to meet to accommodate someone under the ADA is a lot higher than the standard they have to meet under Title VII. Uh, and, and it's a more complex analysis. So generally speaking, and this is where the EEOC's guidance was helpful, uh, one of the first things the employment bar looked at uh, with respect to this issue was, okay, is requiring a vaccine, is that a medical examination? Uh, many, many of you have probably learned over the last six months or so that taking someone's temperature when they come in the door, that is a medical examination. Well, the EEOC has come out and said, no, just the act of giving someone a vaccine, that's not a medical examination. However, We've all probably taken a flu shot or something like that at the workplace or some, uh, some sort of flu shot drive. And inevitably they give you that piece of paper that said, that asks you a few questions. You know, how are you feeling today? Do you have any conditions that might cause an adverse reaction to this? Well, the EEOC has said those questions can be a medical examination. So anytime you're gonna have a medical examination um, of your employees in the workplace, you have to make sure that that requirement of having that examination is job related and consistent with um, business necessity. So uh, one way to sort of protect yourself there is if you are going to require number one, the vaccine, and then number two, actually provide it in the workplace like some people do with, with flu shots, uh, or if you were going to perhaps contract with a third party and have your employees go to them and get vaccinated there. Uh, it, you'd be wise to ask your, uh, the employees who are giving or the contractors who are giving those vaccines to try not to request any medical information or any disability related information, um, if at all possible. You might even look at the questions they're asking and see if there's a way that you could rephrase them uh, so that it doesn't specifically ask you to provide uh, proactively information about a disability. But let's assume that you've decided you're gonna go ahead and require the vaccine and someone, you know, employee A, Joe, we'll call him Joe, uh, Joe comes to you and says, well, I'm not, I can't get the vaccine. Well, the first thing I would ask uh, from a practical, practical perspective is um, if they say they're not vaccinated, well, Joe, do you plan to get vaccinated? That's question number one. <laughs> Maybe Joe just hasn't gotten around to it yet. <laughs> That's not protectable, has nothing to do with a protected reason. But let's assume Joe says, no, no, actually I have this uh, condition, this medical condition, uh, and I can't get uh, one of these vaccines. Well, at that point, the ADA is gonna come into play and you have an obligation to engage in the interactive process with Joe to find out what the situation is and see if you can come up with a reasonable accommodation for that situation. Now, it is okay for you to have 
um, a workplace policy that says we're not going to have, we can't have anyone in the workplace that poses a danger to themselves or others, their coworkers, or the public. Um, however, that has to be an individualized assessment. And so what the EEOC has said is, okay, employers, you don't get out of having to look at the reasonable accommodation piece of this just by saying, well, but if they have COVID, if they, have, if they come in the workplace and they're not vaccinated, they're a danger. Because that's not really entirely true, especially as more and more individuals get this vaccine and we get closer and closer to herd immunity. So what you need to look at is, does somebody not having a vaccine pose a significant risk of substantial harm to my workplace? So think about that. The risk has to be significant. The harm has to be substantial. Now, I think it's fair to say if someone gets COVID-19, that is going to be substantial harm. I think you can probably assume that. So what is your risk level? That's going to depend a lot on the nature of your business, the layout of your office place. Um, and this assessment is going to change over time as more people get vaccinated. If you're requiring the vaccine and you're requiring people to show proof or to get the vaccine at your workplace, you will know how many people in your workplace are vaccinated. Let's assume everyone but Joe is vaccinated and you work in a call center, so you don't really have any uh, interaction with the public, you're gonna have a hard time saying that Joe is gonna pose a significant risk of substantial harm. By contrast, if your employees regularly go out to people's homes, if you work with uh, sensitive populations, if there's a lot of public interaction, if the employees frequently um, are in close proximity to one another, then your risk level is going to be higher simply because of the nature of your business. So the EESC laid out, and this isn't new, it's just really more of an application of an old law. Uh, there's a four-step analysis, mm -hmm. analysis that you're supposed to look at to determine whether you have this level of risk, and that is the duration of the risk, the nature and severity of the potential harm, the likelihood that the potential harm will occur, and then the imminence of the harm. So I think the duration of the risk is really significant for employers because, for example, let's say uh, right now it would be very risky for you to have someone in the workplace that was not vaccinated if, you know, let's say you have a lot of public interaction. Well, the there's a lot of community transmission of the virus right now. So you could see that being a, a risky situation. However, can you really terminate this individual? You have to look at the duration of the risk. If that substantial risk is going to be eliminated in three or four months, maybe you could reasonably accommodate this employee by just furloughing him or her, or uh, just giving them a temporary layoff as opposed to actually terminating their employment. So you're going to want to look at the duration of the risk, look at the time period that you're looking at moving forward. Um, and then also, I think the really significant inquiry is that the likelihood that the potential harm will occur. Um, and that gets to your situation where everyone in your workplace but Joe is vaccinated. Well, that's going to lower the likelihood um, that transmission is going to occur. So I think the most important thing to remember with respect to the ADA is you need to, even if it's brief, try as much as we always tell you to behave consistently, this is an individualized analysis. Look at each situation and the time period, the, the workplace, the nature of the work that's being done and consider um, whether you have met these standards. Um, in addition, I think I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't say that in many contexts, whether it's mandatory vaccines or any other disability related issues, um, I think the days when employers could mandate that certain types of employees work from the office are likely over or near over. I think uh, the EEOC has said that just because somebody let certain employees work from home during this pandemic, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be required to allow that as a reasonable accommodation moving forward. But I think it is going to be more difficult. I think it's going to be easier for employees to make the case that they truly can perform their job duties from home 
simply because so many of them have been doing it um, for the last several months. So that is another, um, that's going to be another reasonable accommodation that you want to consider. Let's say you do have a lot of interaction um, with the public, but Joe's job is more administrative and he can perform his job from home. Well, that's gonna be an accommodation you need to consider when you're deciding whether or not you can take action against Joe for not getting the vaccine. Uh, so, and, and the last thing I'll say about the ADA, and this is something that frankly has concerned me a little bit throughout the pandemic, is that we are all conducting a lot more medical examinations, we're getting vaccine information, we're getting information about why you're not coming to work so that we can submit, uh, submit it to the government under the FFCRA. All of those documents are medical records and they need to be kept separately from your regular personnel records. Do not put the, the fact that this person got their vaccine and the, the letter from CVS or wherever saying that they got the vaccine, don't put that in their personnel file. ADA related medical information needs to be maintained in a separate locked file. So if you don't already have those earmuffs, get them <laughs> and, and, and separate those out. It can be just a locked file cabinet, but make sure you're keeping all that sort of documentation separate. Um, so next, we're going to look at Title VII. And under Title VII, generally speaking, and really one of the contexts we've seen this come up in lately with religious discrimination uh, has to do with dress codes. So you might have heard us um, talking, whether it's your handbook or your other policies, about, well, be careful about uh, religious discrimination under Title VII. So under Title VII, Someone, uh, you cannot discriminate against someone on the basis of a sincerely held religious belief, practice, or observance. Uh, and when I first thought about mandatory vaccines, frankly, that was the issue that concerned me most because I thought, well, if someone doesn't want to get the vaccine for whatever reason, uh, what's to keep them from just saying, I have a sincerely held religious belief, um, whether or not that is true, uh, because they don't want to get the vaccine. And how are we as employers supposed to get into the business of deciding whether someone sincerely holds their religious beliefs? So this sort of surprised me when the EEOC came out yesterday. Um, they said, yes, that's absolutely true. You can't discriminate against someone's sincerely held beliefs. But they expressly said in their guidance that if the employer has a quote unquote objective basis for questioning the religious nature or sincerity of the belief, practice or observance, they can request additional supporting information. So we need to unpack that a little bit. Um, first of all, objective evidence. So maybe you have a couple of employees that say, well, you know, Janet has been talking and just mocking you in the break room about how she totally lied. If we're lucky, maybe Janet will do that in email. That's always nice <laughs> where she says, this isn't true, I don't really hold that belief. Well, that would be objective evidence uh, that perhaps that's not a sincerely held religious belief. Um, but the EEOC didn't say, and if you find out, if you have objective evidence that it might not be sincere, you can fire them. No, they said, you can ask for additional information. Okay, so at that point, you go back to that person um, and ask them, hey, this is what we've heard. Can you do something? Uh, and now what kind of objective evidence would that be? Perhaps they, um, you know, I, maybe you'd have to talk to additional employees. Maybe Janet's going to tell you, I, I go to church every Sunday, uh, you know, who knows? But um, at that point, you could just ask some additional questions and then uh, decide if you feel like you can really support the idea that this is not a sincerely held belief. Um, because the EEOC also said, um, and a lot of the guidance has said, if someone just is, has strong feelings against vaccination, so this would be someone that perhaps is a naturopath, they don't believe in vaccines or certain types of Western medicine, or they prefer natural medicine, that is not protected. Okay, so that's not a religious belief, that is a sincerely held belief, but not a religious belief. So um, we're looking specifically for religion on this. Now, let's say, okay, you know this individual does have a sincerely held religious belief. Well, 
you still might be able to take action against that person if you feel like there is a danger in the workplace um, because you're going to have to accommodate the individual, but you don't have to accommodate them in a way that would cause an undue burden. And that's true under the ADA as well. But under the ADA, you have to show significant financial harm and disruption of your business. And historically, the EEOC has, has more or less decided that most large employers can't meet that standard. It's very, very difficult to meet that standard. You're gonna to have to spend some money and try to accommodate this individual in the workplace. Um, under, relig under Title VII, however, that same terminology, the undue burden, um, you can show that it would be an undue burden if your accommodation of that person would be anything more than de minimis cost or burden to the business. So uh, for example, you say, well, we're gonna have to buy that software to find out how often Janet's clicking on her computer and make sure she's still working and that's gonna cost X and we're gonna have to get her set up out there and um, you know, we're gonna have to do these other things that are gonna cost a little bit of money. Arguably that, that might be okay, depending on what it is that you would have to do um, to accommodate this individual. Uh, but the standard, um, to, the, the standard you have to show under religious discrimination is, is far lower than under the ADA. So with that, um, if we have any questions, I think this one is, is one that a lot of people only recently started thinking about because the vaccine is, is sort of brand new. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to address those. Yeah, we have, we have two questions that I'd like to try to get to real quickly. Um, uh, first comes from a very good client of ours that uh, uh, owns a, uh, a business that provides in-home care services to people. Um, there are situations now where clients will not allow a caregiver to come into their home unless the, the, the caregiving agency, the agency that employs the caregiver can prove or represent that the caregiver has been vaccinated. And the question is, does that sort of then almost make a vaccine in that industry a BFOQ? Like good eyesight is for bona fide occupational qualification, like certain vision requirements that airlines have for pilots. And my, at least my read on that is, I don't know that it rises to the level of a BFOQ like a vision requirement does for a pilot. But the more fundamental answer to the question is, if you as the employer want to require all your caregivers to get vaccinated, the message I'm getting from you, Julia, is you can't. As long as you, you're, you pay attention to the exceptions that you've described and don't run afoul of them. Is that fair assessment? Yes, I, I think that is a fair assessment. I think I agree though, when you say that this doesn't quite rise to the level of a BFOQ, because first of all, even if the, the vast majority of your clients um, are going to require this, um, or you may even decide on your own, gosh, this person's saying they're comfortable with someone that's not vaccinated, but I'm concerned about my own liability here. Um, that might be the case, but you may have, even in a caregiving situation, uh, some clients who are not in a, in a sensitive group. For example, maybe they have purely physical limitations, something like that, not something that would necessarily make their immune system suppressed or, or make them more prone to getting the virus or having a more severe reaction. So that's one thing is it's still possible you might have clients that that individual could still work with. Um, but second, it's always important, and this is really hard, I think, for employers and this has come up in the caregiving context, and that is you can't 100% sort of blame the client for your discrimination. And where you see this more often is, let's say you, you have a client that says, you know what, I, I'm not gonna have any gay or lesbian caregivers in my home. That, your, your sexuality, your sexual orientation, um, all of that is protected under Title VII now. And so you cannot just allow your clients to dictate to you what may be uh, beliefs that if you adhere to those or if you try to apply those in your workplace, those are going to be discriminatory. Um, and in this particular situation, it's going to be especially hard because you might have a much larger number of people who are saying they want someone vaccinated in their home than you typically would have with uh, maybe traditional discriminatory or biased viewpoints. Um, so I think the way you're going to use that is to say, 
accommodating all of these individuals by allowing them to keep working, despite the fact that all these other people want um, a vaccinated individual, is that is going to have substantial harm on, on your business. I mean, you could lose 50%, 75% of your clientele if they, for reasons that are objectively justifiable, are concerned about contracting the virus. So I think that's where most caregivers are going to be able to find protection there. But again, you want to do that analysis every time. Okay, let's take a look. Do we have anybody that this person could safely um, give care to? Uh, you do that analysis before you make that decision about that individual. Yeah, and so I think, Mark, for your purposes, I, I, don't, I don't know that the BFOQ blanket approach necessarily would be the best. I think the approach you would take is the harm approach that Julie is describing. Uh, and if you want to chat more with us about that, if it starts to come up, just uh, give us a call or let us know. Um, here's an interesting question. It's a little off the topic because it deals with COVID testing and not vaccination, but I'm, I'm fascinated by the question. Um, and I think I know the answer, but Julie, I'm going to let you answer it. Um, so now there is an over-the-counter COVID test that you can uh, get and um, uh, take home, use, rapid results. And the question becomes, can we now basically say to all of our workers, um, you know, periodically or whatever, you, now that this is available, you need to get these tests and maybe like once a week or something, you need to show us that you're negative before you come into the workplace. And, you know, the, the EEOC, the Department of Labor, the, the federal government generally the, the, the agencies or departments in the federal government that, that regulate these areas have, have created a lot of additional flexibility for employers. Just like typically without a pandemic going on, you wouldn't be able to just take every, everybody's temperature every day. I mean, it would be a medical examiner of the ADA and you'd have to show that it was consistent with business necessity and it's job related. And the EOC and the DOL have said, no, 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 you know, we're in, a, we're in unusual circumstances. You can do that. I'm thinking probably the same thing with COVID testing. Um, maybe the better question is, can you then shift the expense of that to the worker and say, you need, you need to get out your wallet once a week, buy an over-the-counter COVID test, and every month, do it over the weekend, every Monday, you come in and show us the negative result. What do you think about that? Well, I think a couple of things, because I think generally speaking, um, what, what you're saying is right, that you probably can require this type of testing. I have a couple of concerns, though. First of all, when you require testing um, like that, because some people have been like, for example, requiring someone who you know was positive to get a negative test before they come in and that's right. Sort of um, however, you want to make sure that the test that you're relying on is considered uh, reliable. And I would have some concern. I know some physicians have said that the rapid tests or if you take it early on or if you have lower symptoms are less reliable than say your typical test that takes three or four days to get back or that um, uh, generally speaking, you have to take when you have like maybe the stronger symptoms. Um, someone might come back and say, no, this isn't reasonable because just because I come in here and I have a negative test result, that doesn't really tell you that I'm negative. Um, so I would look at that. You wanna, and usually the way you can make that determination, we're not physicians, but look at, look at the CDC guidelines. Are they telling you how, what types of tests to take or how often to get tested? or when, like, you know, two days after the onset of symptoms, something like that. If the CDC, generally speaking, says that um, you should do something a certain way, you should get tested at a certain time, you're pretty safe relying on that under these laws, um, but that's just something to consider. As for the cost, um, if you're doing, if, if you want one test, that's one thing, but if you um, are requiring people to actually pay for a test, I would have a lot of concern about that on a weekly basis for disparate impact reasons. You can have an impact, a, a negative impact on people who cannot afford to get that test and pay for it week after week after week after week. Um, and unless you have a pretty substantial reason for requiring that type of testing and requiring them to pay for it, uh, I would have some concerns from a Title VII perspective with that. Yeah, because it may be less affordable to certain groups of people than it is to others, which is really the point about disparate, disparate impact. I will, in, in case you guys didn't hear about it, uh, I just heard about it anecdotally, but Elon Musk apparently took four rapid tests five minutes apart. <clears throat> I don't know when he did this a couple weeks ago or whatever. Two of them were positive, two of them were negative. 
<laughs> and so to Julia's point, uh, if, uh, you know, I, I think the rapid over the counter, take it home and do it tests for COVID, I think are just in their infancy. And before I would start, start putting a lot of stock in the results from those, as Julia said, um, so that you don't end up with an argument that you're just being arbitrary and, and uh, even just for morale purposes at work, you might want to wait a little bit for imposing that type of requirement until they are refined a little. And then also do think about Julia's comments. I agree with them entirely about forcing people to pay. It wasn't part of the question, but I thought it would be an interesting twist because that requirement uh, could very well result in a discrimination allegation uh, based on disparate impact. Some people of uh, certain groups being less likely to be able to afford purchasing it on a weekly basis than, than others. Well, we're just at noon. I've been scrolling through the questions. Um, I think we've pretty much answered either live or through some of our chatting, everybody who's had a question so far. For those of you who have asked for a copy of the Albertson's opinion, uh, we will get that to you. For those of you who have asked for a CLE certificate, we will definitely get that to you. Um, this has been fantastic today. Uh, we've had anywhere from 60 to 70 people online at, at any given time. Uh, we really appreciate you turning out to join us for it. Um, once again, if you have additional questions, don't hesitate to let one of us know. We will, we will follow up with you. And um, uh, Chris or Julia, do you have anything to add before we sign off? I don't think so. Thanks so much for attending everybody. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you think of something after the, the webinar. Chris? Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it taking that added time and, and taking this opportunity to find out a little bit more what's going on with some of these developing issues. Um, don't hesitate to contact us if you need anything. Right. Everybody have a great holiday season. Follow up with us with questions if you need to. Take care and stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.